Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Mark Alfano. He is Associate Professor of Philosophy at the Delft University of Technology and the Australian Catholic University. Dr. Alfano uses tools and methods from philosophy and the sciences to explore topics in moral psychology, epistemology, and digital humanities. He studies how people become and remain virtuous, how values become integrated into people's lives, and how these virtues and values are manifested in their perception, thoughts, feelings, deliberations, and behavior. He's the author of books like Character as Moral Fiction and Nietzsche's Moral Psychology. So, Dr. Alfano, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. Thank you, and thank you for that kind introduction. Oh, it's my pleasure. Okay, so, I mean, we're going to talk, I guess, mostly about virtue ethics today. Uh, and, I mean, whenever I think about virtue ethics, I associate it with people like Aristotle. So, sometimes it kind of feels like it is too far back in time and nowadays people tend to be more Kantian or utilitarian or Rawlsian or something like that. So, I mean, uh, taking into account the fact that nowadays we can also study morality uh, through science, uh, what would you say uh, is, would be um, a modern account of virtue ethics? Great. Uh, yeah, so I mean, Aristotle is one way of thinking about uh, about virtue and character. It's not the only one. There's other ancient traditions dating back to Confucius and Mencius, uh, and there's also uh, been sort of a, a tradition of thinking about what makes for a good person, you know, across the world in basically every culture since there's there's been reflection about human behavior. But um, I, I think you're right to point out that talk of virtue can seem a bit old-fashioned or stodgy. Um, and uh, I guess one thing that I would say right off the bat is that it's it's not clear to me that talking about virtue is somehow incompatible with talking either about principles or about rules for behavior or about well-being. Um, so the, the traditional opposition that we all it's an introduction to philosophy of like uh, deontology, consequentialism, and virtue theory um, as being like a choice that you have to make. You have to pick one and, and discard the other two um, is, is probably not on the right track. Um, but that being said, th there are differences in emphases and, um, you know, life is short and we can on only study so many things uh, at a time. Um, so when I think about um, virtue, I tend to follow um, uh, the, this idea that comes out of Philip of Foot that the virtues are whatever dispositions people need in order to uh, thrive and survive in the communities and societies that they find themselves in. Um, and since different people have different dispositions and find themselves in different roles and find themselves in different communities, um, there will be some variability in what dispositions they need, uh, in, therefore in what virtues are sort of uh, appropriate for them and their circumstances. But um, in, in all cases, there will be at least some qualities, characteristics, properties, dispositions that are um, suitable for a, a given person in a given context. Uh, th and those would be the, the virtues for that type of person. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, and can we define virtues generally? I mean, would there be any set of universal virtues or not? Um, so if you think of virtues as um, indexed to the needs that people have in order to, to thrive, um, then if there are universal needs, there will also be universal virtues. So if there are some things that everyone's going to need, no matter what kind of person they are, no matter their um, their circumstances, then then the, uh, the dispositions that answer to those needs would be the the universal virtues. 
And then in the case of needs that are specific to different types of people or specific to people in certain communities or, or roles, then there would be some relativity or some indexicality to, to the relevant virtues in those cases. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, when it comes to ethics and morality, we have this very, very contentious question about if morality is relativistic or not, right? Because, I, I mean, with the scientific tool, tools that we have nowadays, like, for example, studying morality from an evolutionary perspective or in experimental psychology and so social psychology, I mean, isn't it the case that we both have uh, conflicting moral intuitions from an evolutionary perspective and also uh, we are we sort of acquire uh, the moral norms of the society that we grow up with at least to a certain extent so what i'm trying to say here is that uh, if we were to define morality or objective morality as something that is universal or that everyone would agree on or, or something like that, then, I mean, we would have a difficult job doing that. Or, or am I wrong? Um, so if you want universal agreement about every single proposition, then it's pretty clear that that's not in the cards. Um, but that might be too much to, to ask for. Um, in, in my book on moral psychology, uh, I, I argue in the fifth chapter that there's actually much more um, agreement between communities about what's morally good than there is within communities. So you, so you actually see the same kind of divisions within various groups um, across the world uh, uh, being sort of reproduced, but it's the same divisions everywhere. So, so there is a kind of um, disagreement about what's good or what's right, but it's not that um, the people here have one view and the people over there have some other view. It's rather that the people here disagree in one way and the people over there also disagree in the same way. Um, there, there's actually a lot of evidence for this from cross-cultural psychology. Um, uh, there's a psychologist by the name of Schwartz who's uh, been researching uh, intercultural agreement and disagreement about values for, for decades now and tends to find astonishing amounts of agreement across communities with correlations above 0.9. Um, the, there's also been more recent work specifically about not just values generally, but about moral values by, um, by Oliver Curry, who's uh, a psychologist and anthropologist at uh, Oxford University. He did a, a study of um, 60 different communities that have been docu well documented in the anthropological record, um, ranging from small scale hunter ba uh, gatherer bands all the way up to sort of industrialized democracies and found um, that across all of these communities, there's sort of seven main types of values that pretty much everybody thinks are good. Um, and there, there's differences in sort of the, the emphasis that are given to these values. There's differences in um, the, the weights given to them, differences in how people choose to trade them off against each other when they conflict. Um, but the basic values seem to actually be quite universal. Um, and actually, I think from an evolutionary perspective, that's what we should expect because we're all the same species. Um, we, we all uh, have, uh, you know, we're, we're bipedal, we're, we're mammals, we, we have certain kinds of needs, we have certain kind of gestation period, you know, we have uh, a certain life expectancy, and there is some variance in that, but it's all variance around a mean that is the mean for for our species. Um, so, so I actually think that you know, if if you pro approach this from an evolutionary perspective, um, you'll end up expecting that there will be some variance, and that it, it will be sort of the same variance in different places, rather than that there will be um, sort of one type over here and another type over there. Mm -hmm. Uh, but that universality that you're talking about, uh, 
uh, I mean, what is it exactly about? Is it that people agree on the types of questions that are important or they agree really on the specific content of the moral values that they espouse? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So it, it depends on the level of analysis. Um, so y you will find, of course, different ways of implementing the same values. So for instance, you know, here in Europe, uh, we drive our cars on the right side of the road. In the United Kingdom and Japan and various other places, they drive on the left. And you might say that this is some sort of deep disagreement. Um, and of course, if someone were to try to drive on the left side of the road here in Europe, we would get really upset about that. But that's underpinned, that's underwritten by a, a shared value, which is we all want to be safe when we're getting from one place to another. We all want to be secure when we're, when we're traveling. And we've decided to, to ensure that by having a pattern of cooperation that's sort of indexed to a local, um, to a location. But that pattern of cooperation is, is in both cases underpinned by the same value. Um, I think the same thing can be said for many, probably most moral norms. So people tend to care about um, reciprocating uh, benefits and sometimes harms. They care about their families. Um, they care about fair distributions of resources. They care about uh, whether if they leave something in, in the room and come back the next day, it'll still be there for them to use. So they care about property in a certain sense of the term. Um, and then there are different ways of implementing those things. So, you know, we can reciprocate by, um, by uh, having, uh, you know, gift giving ceremonies, or we can reciprocate by um, praising one another. We can reciprocate in, in all kinds of different ways, in the same way we can take care of our families or care about our families in, in different ways. Um, we can institute something like property in different ways uh, in different communities, but all of these are underpinned by the same kind of shared values, which all have to do with something like cooperation or the ability to, to, to benefit mutually from, uh, from strategic interactions. Mm -hmm. And since we're talking about virtue ethics, could you tell us what moral character is about? <laughs> That's a big question. Um, uh, so, so I think of character as the constellation of dispositions that a person embodies. And so their character will um, involve a set of um, ways that they're disposed to think, feel, decide, um, and, and be motivated um, in a wide range of circumstances. Um, so we can then sort of individuate virtues by um, thinking of either the, the situations or, or um, the, the, the norms that they're sensitive to or the needs that they answer to, or sort of sometimes I think it's helpful to think of them as um, indexed to the, sort of the emotions that they, they govern or control or express. Um, and that's an idea that dates back at least to Aristotle. Um, he, he argues that, uh, or he claims, I suppose, he doesn't so much argue for it, but he says that virtues are, um, are means with respect to various emotions that people can feel. So for instance, courage is a, a disposition to fear the right things in the right way at the right time for the right reason, to feel confidence towards uh, various plans in the right way at the right time for the right reasons. And if you think of other emotions like anger, contempt, disgust, um, compassion, whatever they might be, each of these is going to be sort of the sort of thing that you can that you can uh, be disposed to um, experience and feel towards the right things at the right time for the right reasons and so on. And when someone has those dispositions sort of up and running in the way that that they should be, um, we call that disposition of virtue. Um, and when it's malfunctioning to some extent, we might just say it's a quirk or that if it's malfunctioning a lot, we might call it a vice. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and why is it the case that in your book, character as moral fiction, you talk about character as uh, fiction in this case? Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of evidence that was built up in the second half of the 20th century that suggests that um, people are not sensitive to reasons in the way that I just described, that um, if they're feeling fear, if they're feeling confidence, if they're feeling contempt or disgust or whatever it might be, in many cases that's not for any good reason, but because some strange situational factor sort of impinged on their psychology. Um, and so that might lead you to think that people don't have character as traditionally conceived, or certainly that they don't have the virtues as they're traditionally conceived, because the, the things that actually make a difference to our patterns of thought, feeling, behavior, and so on, are not the sorts of things that, that you might expect to, to make a difference. Um, and not the sorts of things that people, when they introspect about their own psychology, would say are the things that matter. Um, but there's also this uh, line of research from around the same period that suggests that telling people that they have a certain character trait especially when you praise them for it, and especially when there's some evidence that your praise is on the right track, can get them to sort of simulate the disposition. So the idea would be that um, it's, it may not be the case that someone is called courageous because they are courageous, but rather that they're courageous because they're called courageous. So it functions as a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, And so, th so that's why I called the book Character is Moral Fiction. The idea was that, you know, we can sort of um, pretend our way into being virtuous or pretend our way into making others virtuous. Um, all of that said, I should also point out that a lot of the social psychology that I was relying on at the time has turned out to be um, not very robust. A lot of it does not seem to replicate very well. So I've had to rethink in the last... Uh, five years or so, uh, exactly how much of this view is, is actually defensible or, or supported by the empirical evidence. I, I still think it's an interesting idea, um, but I'm less confident than I was in 2013. Mm -hmm. And how did your view change since uh, you published the book and since we went through the sort of replication crisis in social psychology? Yeah, I, 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 so one thing to say is that social psychology is not the only field that's having a replication crisis. Sure. Uh, uh, the, there, there seem to be r issues about replication and reproducibi reproducibility in many of the social sciences and also many of the, the hard sciences. Uh, neuroscience looks like it's in pretty bad shape. Uh, and most recently, I've been looking at uh, the field of machine learning, and it, it looks like less than 10% of published studies in machine learning can be reproduced. So it's a, it's a total mess across the board. Um, but as you say, social psychology was, was hit pretty hard by this and um, was one of the first areas to be hit by this. Um, it, it all sort of got kicked off when Daryl Bem published uh, a, a paper um, suggesting that people could see the future um, arguing for a kind of parapsychology or, um, uh, yes, yeah, supernaturalism or something. Um, this was published in a, in a peer reviewed major journal in the field. And people said, basically, um, if that's the kind of thing that meets our standards, then our standards aren't good enough. Um, and since then there's been a lot of, uh, work to try to, to raise those standards. So for instance, the, the folks in the, um, Society for the Improvement of Psychological Science, uh, the, called SIPS, uh, have been doing a lot of really good work. Um, and then the folks associated with the Open Science Framework, OSF, uh, have been doing a, a lot of really interesting work. Um, w one of the, the most impressive um, uh, projects to come out of this kind of crisis is the uh, set of papers, I think there's three of them so far, um, called the Many Labs Project, where instead of running one to six small-scale um, experiments at one location, 
um, people are collaborating across dozens of um, lab groups to to try to get like a, a large representative sample that's actually adequate to um, examining the the questions that people want to ask. Um, and the the many labs papers have shown that approximately one in three studies in social psychology can be reproduced successfully. Um, that's not great. But um, personality psychology has actually done a lot better. Um, so I, I forget off the top of my head what the, what the exact number is, but the majority of um, papers, the majority of studies in personality psychology do actually replicate. Um, so this has sort of forced me to to go back and say, well, you know, I thought that a lot more was um, attributable to the situation than to the the person, um, but that was based on research that doesn't hold up. So maybe actually I, I had it exactly wrong, and there is something to to this idea of individual differences. There is something to this idea that um, people have. Um, uh, sort of robust dispositions to behave and think and feel in, in various ways. And if that's the conclusion that you you draw, then actually virtue ethics and virtue epistemology look a lot more plausible. And you may not have to go with the sort of self-fulfilling prophecy argument that I had in my 2013 book. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you talk about moral character, I mean, I'm not even sure if, if this is the best way to phrase the question, but are you focusing mostly on people's uh, sort of psychological traits or on how they behave? And I, I'm saying that I'm not sure if, if this is the best way to articulate the question because it, it, is, it doesn't even make much sense to me to separate something that is occurring, let's say, purely in people's minds from their actions. Yeah, yeah, I, I sort of am resistant to that way of framing the question as well, because in the vast majority of cases, when people demonstrate a pattern of behavior, it's underwritten by or, or explained by a pattern of thoughts, feelings, emotions, deliberations, plans, and so on. Um, and in fact, what we tend to do is we infer people's mental states from the way they behave, right? And it's a standard thing to do. Um, so the, there has been this um, idea floating around for the last couple of decades in the the virtue ethics literature that no, it's not about behavior. It's about the mind. It's about people's values. It's about their um, their psychologies in some way. Um, but of course, action expresses people's thoughts, feelings, values, and so on. So there's a part reasonable. It's it's. Um, one is expressive of the other. It's um, evidence for, for what's going on in the other. It's how we like figure out both about other people and about ourselves what's in the mind. So I, I would say that um, while behavior isn't the only thing that matters, it's certainly something that matters morally. Yes, uh, and isn't it also the case that it sounds a bit weird if people, for example, think or say something and then behave in the opposite way or in some way that contradicts what they say they think and feel and things like that? Um, yeah, I mean, it would be really weird if the patterns of someone in someone's behavior were completely disjoint from the patterns in their minds, right? We, that, that, that would be like a delusion or something. Um, in less extreme cases, we might say that someone's hypocritical, uh, or even less extreme cases, we might say they're forgetful or that they're whimsical, or um, you know that they they don't have like a stable character, or that they they change their minds easily. Um, we might say that they're self-deceived, um, and all of these things can be be true in different cases. Um, but normally, I think it's it's pretty clear that there is a connection between what someone does and what someone says they, they care about. Uh, and that's, that's connected because 
we have at least some introspective awareness about what we care about. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's also just that if people say that they care about something and then behave in a contradictory way, then, I mean, even from a moral perspective, most of the time people won't take the person seriously. Right. Yeah, I mean, if there's um, obvious disconnection between these two uh, and others can observe that, that will undermine any kind of trust you might have. Um, in the person who's who's contradicting themselves in, in their behavior in that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's get a little bit into the is ought dichotomy because in your book, at a certain point, you talk about a thick and thin concepts of of virtues, I guess. And uh, I will just read uh, a portion here. A short bit of it. Another argument as it that the thick concepts of virtue ethics like prudence, charity, modesty capture intuitive moral psychology better than the thin concepts of consequentialism and deontology like goodness, rightness, obligation and that these thick concepts help to bridge the is ought gap. So uh, could you explain here uh, what you mean by thin and thick concepts and how can they help us bridge this gap? Um, so the idea of, or the distinction between thick and thin in this sense is due to Bernard Williams, mm -hmm. um, who uh, uh, argued that um, a lot of the vocabulary and a lot of the concepts that we have for thinking about um, ethics in particular um, have sort of, on the one hand, some descriptive and explanatory content. Um, so they can be true in virtue of um, things that are observable about the, the person or action that they're attributed to. Um, and also have some kind of normative content. So they, they have some notion of um, evaluating something as good or bad, or right or wrong. Um, so for instance, if you, if you think of a person uh, being described as courageous, um, you should be able to like predict how they'll act in certain circumstances. So they won't, won't back down in the face of certain kinds of threats. Um, they, they'll stand up for themselves and for people that they care about. Um, they won't be overly afraid uh, or they won't be afraid at all in certain kinds of circumstances where others might. Um, so that's all sort of um, uh, descriptive and explanatory. It helps you predict their behavior. It helps you predict the emotions that they're going to experience or not experience. Um, but if we call someone courageous, generally, unless we're being sarcastic or, or speaking in a sort of weird way, that's also a kind of praise. It's describing someone as, as morally good, at least in, um, in one sense or in, in one aspect of their personality. Um, so that's what makes um, courage a, a thick concept. Uh, it's, it's got both this explanatory, descriptive, predictive um, aspect to it and uh, an evaluative or normative aspect to it. Um, and uh, Bernard Williams distinguishes these thick concepts, which um, you see most prominently in discussions of, of virtue, um, from so-called thin concepts, which um, have only normative content to them. So if you just describe a person as good or a good doer, um, it's hard to know, does that mean that they're they're going to do good by giving to charity, that they're going to do good by standing up for what they believe in, that they're going to do good by um, behaving modestly when others praise them, that they're going to do good by being loyal to their friends. Like, there's, there's so many ways that that could play out that it's um, it, it may give you a, a very um, uh, abstract notion of the general sorts of things that the person might do or might not do, but it, it doesn't give you much uh, and, and it might not give you anything. Similarly, if you describe an action as right, um, you know, you try to think of all the actions that are right, what exactly um, unites them. It, it's a very disparate, diverse category. 
Um, and so that's what makes notions of, of rightness and wrongness as well as notions of goodness and badness thin in Bernard Williams's sense, which is not to denigrate them, of course. It's, it's a perfectly reasonable thing to call something good or bad or right or wrong, um, in, 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 if that's the, the correct way to describe it. Um, but it doesn't give us much of a sense uh, for explaining, predicting, and describing uh, actual behavior and, and actual mental states. Um, so Williams thought that for this reason, if we want to have a sort of rich moral psychology that gets into the details of how people are thinking, how they're deciding, how they're reacting, and, and how they're acting, um, it's helpful to employ thick concepts. Um, and this is associated with the so-called is-ought gap because um, when people talk about the is-ought gap, they'll usually associate it with uh, a passage from, uh, from Hume, uh, where he says, you essentially, um, it's not so easy to infer an ought from an is than one might think. Um, this passage is often misinterpreted as Hume saying that it's impossible to infer an ought from an is. He doesn't actually say that. He, he actually is just complaining that people sort of slip back and forth from one to the other without giving much reason for, for that transition. Um, but uh, Hume is definitely right that it's not straightforward how to get between these two things. Um, so, you know, if I say like, um, you know, climate change is occurring, that doesn't mean that climate change ought to occur. Right. So you don't want to infer directly from an ought to an is, um, unless you think the world is already perfect. Um, and similarly, you don't want to infer from an is to an ought not either, uh, at least not every single time, because things are not as bad as they could be either. Um, what's nice about um, thick concepts is that they simultaneously um, say something about how the world is and because they have this normative aspect as well, express some attitude about how the world ought to be. Um, and that's why Williams thought that, that thick concepts are, are useful um, for, for bridging this divide. Now, you might think that certain uh, thick concepts um, are, are sort of malformed, that they, they have like the wrong normative valence associated with them. Um, so say, suppose you're, you're skeptical that chastity is a virtue. You might think that, you know, talking about whether someone's chaste or whether they have the virtue of chastity um, might seem to have empirical content. So it describes something about their attitudes and their actions and then also have some normative content. But that normative content might not belong there. Um, so the, there's still going to be um, problems uh, moving back and forth between is and ought, even inside thick concepts, I think. But um, to the extent that you, you think you uh, set sort of rightly deployed, they will be helpful in, um, in bridging this divide. Mm -hmm. So, but isn't it the case that nowadays when people talk about the is ought dichotomy or the is ought gap, uh, I mean, the is part is uh, tends to be associated with, uh, for example, scientific data or facts or uh, what we learn about uh, what reality is, how the world works and things like that. So, uh, I mean, isn't it still difficult to move from those sorts of things to odds or to moral values because for example earlier you were uh, giving the example of okay so uh, climate change is occurring or climate change is a fact so uh, i mean what should we do about that should we do something to try to tackle it Sh uh, should we just let it let it happen and see what happens then uh, i mean be, because it's not uh, i mean you were talking about hume and he was saying how it was difficult to move from one place to the other but i i, I mean it's still hard 
to do that, right? And uh, it doesn't seem clear to me that there's any process or mechanism or anything in science or philosophy that forces you to go from uh, a fact, for example, to a given moral value. I mean, if you accept a fact, you are not forced to associate a specific moral value to it, right? Yeah, I, I think that's that's right. But um, there are things that basically everybody cares about, um, and you can make the certain kinds of moral inferences fairly easily by putting those presuppositions into hypothetical imperatives. Um, so, you know, if, if you think, uh, well. Um, I want to be able to look at myself in the mirror and not feel ashamed in 30 years. Um, and I know that I won't be able to do that uh, if I don't help in some way to deal with the climate crisis. Now I've got a very good reason to help do something about the climate crisis. Um, so, so you're right that if I really just don't give a shit, um, if I don't care at all, um, then these sorts of things are going to have no claim on me. Um, but fortunately, in the vast majority of people, um, those concerns are present. Um, and uh, because we have certain kinds, as, as I was saying earlier, because um, it, across communities around the world, people tend to share certain values and concerns, um, you actually do get um, if not outright consensus, you get a lot of agreement about what ought to be done, at least in broad strokes. Um, exactly how to implement things, again, as I said before, there's lots of ways to, to implement the same shared values, but that doesn't mean that those aren't there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just that, uh, I mean, I've, I don't know if you agree with this or not, but at least it seems to me that... Uh, I mean, there's a, an important difference epistemologically and even maybe metaphysically speaking between uh, facts and, uh, and values. Because, I mean, if you know a particular fact about how the world works or a set or you have a set of data, scientific data, for example, uh, I mean, they don't bring attached to them a moral value or a set of moral values. So, I mean, we still have to deal with those types of things uh, differently or, or not. Yeah, I think that's right. So, I mean, when we talk about values, that it, it can be a little bit ambiguous. Um, one way of thinking of values is that they're attitudes about what's good and bad, um, right? So that would mean that, like, for instance, if I value health, then I evaluate health as good. Um, uh, so, so then a value would be something like a mental state or a, a motivational state. Um, alternatively, you can think of values as the objects of those attitudes. So health would be a value in that case. And my caring about it would be what makes it m one of my values. Um, or you could say they're the, the sorts of things that we should care about, even if we don't. Um, and one way to get from what we do care about to what we should care about is to, to ask, well, what would we care about if we were fully informed and we thought about it carefully and we had plenty of time to deliberate? Um, that's a tradition that, that goes way back to uh, in, in the history of philosophy, and there are various problems with it, but I think there's something uh, to that uh, uh, approach. Um, and if you you use that approach, then what you're saying um, is that, uh, yes, you can describe the world and not make any inferences about what, what ought to be done, but if you also throw in um, the fact that people have these standing motivations, that they have these values, then there is going to be some pressure for them to make inferences about what they ought to do. Um, and, of course, they, they can respond by denying the facts. They can respond by changing what they care about. They can respond by just stubbornly refusing to make the inference. Um, all of these things are certainly possible, but there is a kind of pressure that, that one faces when one uh, 
really has a value and one sees that it's uh, relevant to a, a, a fact that's being presented. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think that people even try to invent their set of facts, like, for example, many science deniers do that. They don't like one particular conclusion derived from science because it clashes with their set of values and then they go back and try to come up with a different set of facts, right? Yeah, yeah, and so the fact that people are disposed to do that kind of thing shows the, exactly what I was saying, that there is a, a pressure to make certain kinds of inferences about what ought to be done from the combination of a set of values and a, a set of, uh, of purported facts. Um, and people feel that pressure, so when you give them facts that make them uh, feel like they ought to draw certain conclusions that they don't want to draw, they, they won't just sort of shrug. In some cases, they'll actually try to invent alternative facts, as our, um, my esteemed president's pre press secretary put it, um, to, <laughs> to, to uh, allow them to at least pretend that that inference is not warranted. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, earlier you were referring to the fact that uh, social psychology and, I mean, other areas of the social sciences, but we're focusing on that. Uh, social psychology has been through a replication crisis, and since you wrote your book, maybe some of the literature that you review there, uh, I mean, maybe at the present moment, um, lots of it is no longer uh, <coughs> sci scientifically viable, let's say. Uh, but on the other hand, you were also referring to the fact that, for example, disciplines like personality psychology tend to be more robust. So, I, I mean, since one of the critiques of virtue ethics has to do with uh, situationism in the sense that people, uh, for example, in social psychology had been uh, studying how the same person in different situations behaves in different ways. I mean, was that one of the bits of social psychology that, uh, that, that, is, that is questionable nowadays or, and then that, that would give even more power to the virtue ethics uh, propo proposal or, or not? Yeah, yeah, so you, you might wonder about the situationist critique in the first place and, and think like, well, of course people do different thing, things in different circumstances. They're not like mindless robots, right? So, you know, the fact that um, I'm, I'm willing to take my clothes off in my bedroom and not willing to do it on the train, um, it doesn't say that like, oh, wow, situationism, we have no idea what's going on in people's heads, they have no dispositions. Um, that, that would be like a really stupid inference to draw, right? Um, so the, the worry with situationism, as I understood it, um, was not that people do different things in different contexts, because of course they do. It was rather that um, the things that actually explain do different things in different contexts aren't reasons at all. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, there was this famous study out of Harvard University that suggested that whether someone behaved in a friendly way or not was largely driven by whether they were holding a cup of hot coffee or iced coffee. And the, the idea was supposed to be that um, if the coffee is hot, that makes you feel warm. And when you're warm, you're sort of socially warm as well. So like from temperature to social warmth, and then you'll be nice to other people. Whereas if you your hand is cold because of the iced coffee, then you'll be cold in a social way, frigid, t unkind towards others. Mm -hmm. And that, like, if, if you were to try to explain that to the person who acted in that way, uh, or if you were trying to, to, to justify your actions by appealing to that, like, well, why were you so cold to that person? Oh, well, I was holding iced coffee. Like, that would be a really stupid thing to say, <laughs> like a really bizarre reason to give. Um, and there were a bunch of these studies that, that pointed towards like embodied metaphors and 
um, uh, sort of uh, ambient social, uh, ambient like um, climate, uh, so like temperature, the the amount of noise in the room, the level of the light, um, the the ambient smells. Like there was this study that suggested that when people smelled sweet smells, like a bakery, they were more inclined to give to charity uh, than otherwise. And, and if you ask someone, like, why did you give to charity? And they said, oh, yeah, because I walked past a bakery. They'd be like, why? Like, that's a really weird reason to give to charity. It's not even a reason at all, actually. Um, so there were all these studies that suggested that what it was explaining people's behavior was um, not like temptations, not uh, reasons that you can kind of say, like, yeah, I could see why you would do that, but it's still not something you should do, but rather, like, just bizarre stuff that doesn't make any sense. Um, and if that's what's driving human behavior, then you might think, well, okay, it's just hopeless to appeal to virtues which are supposed to be sensitive to things that matter. Um, so that's why I was, I was uh, sort of, um, uh, to some extent, uh, following the, the situationist critique in the book. Um, now, fortunately, the situation, the, um, replication crisis in social psychology has hit exactly that line of research the hardest. So all the weird stuff about fishy smells and uh, uh, all the weird stuff about um, embodied metaphors, um, all that kind of stuff does not replicate. Um, but the stuff that is appealing to reasons, even if they're temptations or bad reasons, um, that is not so bad. That, that seems to be fairly robust. So given that, I think we actually have pretty good reason to appeal to um, individual dispositions that are sensitive to things that are actual objects of concern um, and talk about people's personality in, in that way. And when th those dispositions are also morally good, we can call them virtues if we want. Um, so, so for that reason, I think that uh, a virtue theoretic approach to morality is uh, is pretty promising. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that people's moral behavior is much more consistent than uh, social psychologists were painting it before in the sense that maybe people's behavior doesn't vary that much when they are exposed to different situations? Like, for example, if someone says that uh, they, one of their values is to help the needy. I mean, maybe if people are exposed to a homeless person, uh, I mean, that she will help her anyways, instead of only helping people that have uh, a good, a nice presentation, let's say. Yeah, I mean, so I, I wouldn't go so far as to say that you can explain all of someone's behavior in terms of their personality, um, but the, the the evidence no longer seems to me to indicate that you can't explain much at, at all in terms of personality. Um, so, so there does seem to be quite a bit of consistency um, for, within persons um, in, in terms of their patterns of behavior, but also their patterns of thought, feeling, and emotion. Um, when it comes to, to things like um, helping a, a homeless person, I mean, it, it is going to depend on where you are. Like, I, I spent seven years in New York City, um, and if I tried to help every person that I encountered on the way from home to work, um, I'd never get to work. Um, so, it, you know, it depends on how many opportunities you have. Um, in societies where there are it, where homelessness is much less of a problem, you'll find I think a lot more consistency in that particular kind of context. Um, in societies like in New York City or in California, where it's a huge problem, uh, relying on individuals to handle it seems to me to be the, the wrong way to approach it. We need broader systemic uh, changes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, if we take into account that uh, people's behavior tends to be consistent and they tend to have a personality that carries on during their lifetime, let's say, do you think that uh, 
some effects from things like labeling and self-concept that you talked about in your book uh, might still play an important role Be because I mean in the, in if that was the case then maybe it's a bit harder to change people's behavior or, or not yeah um, so as far as I know there haven't been any large-scale pre-registered attempts to reproduce or replicate these studies of labeling the the sort of self-fulfilling prophecy effect that I, I mentioned earlier um, so I, I kind of have to be a bit um, <laughs> agnostic about that at this point um, when I wrote the book um, I, I was able to find uh, a couple dozen studies that all pointed in the same direction but I'm now uh, older and wiser and I'm not sure <laughs> Not sure whether that means that they, there was publication bias um, or whether that's actually a, a, a real effect. Um, I still think that it's plausible and it, it's an interesting hypothesis that should be tested. Um, but I, I'm less confident than I was before. Um, it still seems to me that people's personalities and, and character do and can change over the course of their lifetime. So maybe not over the course of a few minutes and all the time. But people do change to some extent. Um, and if that's right, we might want to know what accounts for it. Um, one of the things that might account for it is th that kind of social interaction. Um, but as I said, we, I, I really don't know. <laughs> and, and I mean, as a philosopher, do you think that there's any good propo proposal coming from philosophy uh, suggesting uh, the tools that we could use to change people's behavior, taking into account that most of it would be consistent throughout their, their lifespans? Yeah, I mean, so I, I recently finished up a, and published a book on Nietzsche's moral psychology that to some extent go, goes in this direction. So he has a, a sort of drive psychology and he thinks that some drives or maybe even most drives are instincts so that they're innate, um, which would mean that um, they, th there's something that, that you're born with that is sort of uh, hard to change, um, but maybe not impossible to change. Um, and at the same time, he actually is the source of this idea that I mentioned earlier of um, trait descriptions as self-fulfilling prophecies. Um, so you might think, like, well, how do you put those two things together, right? If it's if it's innate, then it's uh, it's sort of stuck that way. Um, and if it's uh, a socially acquired self-fulfilling prophecy, then obviously it's not stuck that way. Um, but what he seems to have in mind is that people um, have uh, drives which are sort of um, standing dispositions to want to engage in certain types of actions broadly um, broadly considered or broadly described and exactly how those get expressed whether the say an aggressive drive gets expressed by becoming a violent criminal or by becoming a, a very incisive arguer um, will depend on the shaping influences of one's community. Um, so you, you kind of get to have both of these things if you think that the way, there, there are so many different ways of expressing the same drive or instinct that there's going to have to be some sort of um, shaping or, or um, constraining and that that shaping and constraining is done in large part by the by one's social interactions, including acts of labeling someone as having a certain disposition. Um, so I, I think that that's a plausible um, story about how people end up behaving the way they do and how they have the sort of precise shape of their um, character that they do. Um, but it's also quite speculative. Um, and it, it would be really, really hard to research this in in a scientific way because you'd sort of have to randomize people to the their upbringing. Um, yeah. So you'd have to you'd have to like 
select people, a large sample of people, uh, you know, when they're babies, or maybe even before, and decide how they're going to be enculturated in a, in a randomized way. And probably that goes against research ethics and probably you wouldn't get parental consent. And if you did, maybe those parents should have their children taken away. Um, so so it, it may end up remaining a sort of uh, speculative thing for that reason. But I do think that there's something to that idea. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just speculating, but maybe we could also find out that there are people with certain personality traits uh, which render them uh, more more open to changing, let's say. Like, I, I don't know, if we just look at the big five, uh, just in a principled manner, I would imagine that people that are more open to experience would be also more open to change because they uh, they like to be, or it's easier for them to get in touch with new and different ideas. I don't know. That's really interesting. Yeah, so um, that's actually something that comes up a little bit in Nietzsche as well. So he has this idea that um, there's a certain kind of second order disposition that people have. So some people are sort of more stable or more... Um, uh, ossified in their dispositions. They, they won't change very easily or very much. And others are sort of more easily swayed. Uh, and um, both of those can, can be good or bad in various ways. I mean, yeah. if you say ossified, that sounds, um, that sounds kind of negative. If you say that someone is, is you know, robust, <laughs> that sounds kind of po positive. And likewise, if you say that someone is um, you know, uh, whimsical or, or capricious, that sounds bad, but it, uh, if you say that someone is sort of open, then that can sound good. Um, but it, it does seem pretty plausible that there will be some variance across individuals in how open they are to change. Um, th there's been some research by uh, psychologists, personality psychologists like um, Sanjay Srivastava at University of Oregon on uh, and, and Gerard Saucier as well, also at Oregon, on change in personality over the lifespan. Um, uh, I'm, I'm failing to recall exactly what they have to say about what predicts how much someone changes, um, but there is evidence that people do change slowly, uh, and not all of them, um, over the course of the lifespan. Um, and there's also been some interesting uh, research in philosophy on on this idea, um, people talk sometimes about transformative experiences. Mm -hmm. So experiences that, that change the kind of person that you are. Um, and um, most recently, there's a, a book uh, called um, is it Planning for Changing Selves, I think, by uh, Richard Pettigrew, um, which talks about uh, what, what we can do in light of the fact that we know that we might change the kind of person that we are. Um, how to sort of plan for being someone else. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's a really interesting and, and tricky problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, o okay, so Dr. Alfano, we are reaching our time limit, so just before we go, would you like to tell people what are the best places on the internet and or other mediums as well, if you want, uh, for them to get in touch with your work. Oh, um, right. Not the best places on the internet in general. <laughs> uh, oh, no, 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 no. For, for, for them to get in touch with your work. Yeah, um, yeah so I, I have a professional uh, website, uh, alfanophilosophy.com, uh, and uh, most of my papers are up there. I also have a Phil Papers profile where uh, my, my papers are available. Uh, and of course, you can just email me if you if you want a copy of a PDF of something. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I will leaving all of that in the description box of the interview so that people can go and check it out. It's very interesting. So Dr. Alfano, thank you again for taking the time to come on the show. And it was a real pleasure to talk to you. Thank you, Ricardo.
Hi everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. So to keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. Any amount, even just $1, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and subscribe to the channel. You can also support me on PayPal or Subscribestar. All of the links are in the description box of the interview. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perel Galarsen, Lau Guerrero, Chantel Gelinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Condriano, Yane Henninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, John Connors, Adam Castle, Vega Gidi, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, David Diaz, Dr. Jerry Muller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Voss, and Bo Weingart, and also my three producers, Isar Weber, Rosie and Jim Frank. Thank you for all.